Sure, we're live. <laughs> so welcome back, guys. Because we had such amazing feedback from our um, Facebook Live last week, we've managed to persuade this lovely gentleman to come back. I apologize that I look like I'm having an alien abduction at the moment because <laughs> 30 seconds before we went live, I had a power cut. So we're coasting it and we're doing okay. Um, please welcome back the lovely Professor Daniel Mills. I'm so grateful that he's found the time to come back and continue our conversation about pain and behavior. Please tell our viewers a bit about yourself, Mr. Daniel Mills. Um, I, I'm Daniel Mills. I'm Professor of Veterinary Behavioral Medicine at the University of Lincoln. I graduated as a vet from Bristol in 1990, went into a small animal practice initially with the PDSA, then into mixed practice before moving into academia where I've been in Lincolnshire ever since. So, and slowly trying to sort of build up an evidence base on behavior and veterinary behavior and things like that. And also how animals' minds work. Yeah. How long have you been interested in Was that one of the drivers to do veterinary or was it? <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny it's a funny story because uh, I'm, I'm the youngest of five kids and um, I'll, I'll tell you this story it's nothing to do with pain but uh, my mum <laughs> my brothers were born first then my sisters then there was this little gap and then there was me my mum used to say I've got two boys two girls and Daniel <laughs> and I finally I said to her like, mum when am I going to be a boy <laughs> uh, but, but the thing is the um my brothers, because they were close together, they played with each other. My sisters were close together. They played with each other. There was a gap. So I played with the dogs. Right. And my mum said, you know, by the age of two, I was training the Cocker Spaniel that we had, who sadly was put to sleep by my father because um, Amber bit a lady in a wheelchair. Right. Um, so I do wonder how much of my interest in behavior goes back to me losing yeah. my best friend. Yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. Dad. So a couple of, well, I think about three of the CAM team do this voluntary work because they too have been part of the loss of animals that have been euthanized because of behavior. You know, so it'll be a bite or a, a behavior change that isn't conducive to them living in the family household anymore. And you think that and go, was that actually pain related? Mm. I mean, the other, the other thing is, I've got to be honest, you know, I, I, loved, I loved being at university. Uh, we had some great lecturers, but I hated the vet course. It was all just <laughs> learn this, learn this, and then you can apply. And then behavior came along, and it was, you know what? You have to think about this. And virtually all of our year, except me, said, oh, we hate this. Tell us what we need to know for the exam. And I was thinking, no, you, you come out, and you've got to think about this. There are, there's no clear answers. You've got to work it out. Mm -hmm. That is what I was, that's what really got me switched on. Um, mm. I, you know, I love learning. I love meeting people and, and learning. And even if, you know, it doesn't have to be intellectual, just learning about people. So yeah. I think that's what got me there. And it was sort of a field that, yeah, you know, I mean, of course, there's been ethologists going around for donkey's years. But as far as veterinary behavior goes, it was unexplored. And um, again, you know, just a, a sort of story I, I i get i'm fascinated by the things i know very little about so that's what i think dragged me into the, all of this um but so just explain the difference between ethology and behavior so people can so, kind of catch up so historically behavior has been studied in two ways in in europe the study of behavior was very much driven by the ethologists and the ethologists people like conrad lorenz you may have heard of nico tinberg and, and von frisch who got the nobel prize the three of them and they would tend to study the behavior of animals in the natural setting in order to work out the rules. So they came up with the idea that, um, well, one of Renz's idea was about um, sort of motivation and drive in animals. Um, Tim Bergen tended to talk about fixed action patterns and the control between the, the relationship between stimulus and responses in, in a natural setting and the natural factors that controlled it. Whereas in America, the study of animal behavior was very much tied into the birth of psychology as a science. And it was looking at the general rules of learning. Um, so people like Skinner, um, Watson, et cetera, who, who you know, tried to develop the fundamental rules that could be applied to animal learning. But one of the issues is that they were studying rats in boxes where there was nothing else in the environment. And 
what the sort of new wave is doing is is thinking well how much of that actually really applies mm. um you've got those two traditional approaches and you know the behavioral approach of people like skinner still dominates a lot of our thinking um with regards to behavior but as with all of these things you, you know it's like the nature nurture argument you know, nature is sort of inbuilt and that's what the ethologists were emphasizing nurture was um sort of it's all shaped by the environment and that's what the behaviorists in america were studying and the truth is somewhere in between yeah, yeah. Uh, so but anyway that's that's not about pain so we ought to get talk about pain. no 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 absolutely but i think um, i think you've hit on something that's really important is that people have got to remember that all fields around any topic especially pain is always changing and you mentioned about Skinner and actually it being quite a well established, but is it still actually completely within in the modern era? You know, you're still living on people's behavioral thoughts from quite a long time ago. So, so yes, yeah, I think this is one of the things that people get confused about. First of all, you know, the, the, the question with Skinner stuff is just because something can affect an animal's behavior, that doesn't mean that is what controls its behavior in the real world. So you can, you know, you can isolate an animal in a box and you can pull this out. And I'm not saying animals don't learn through the sort of processes, but what do they actually attend to is actually what's quite important. The other mm -hmm. thing that people sometimes get confused about is, yeah, science changes the whole time. But that doesn't mean it's just somebody's opinion. The whole point about science is it's what they call falsifiable. You can disprove it. If you mm. can't disprove it, it just becomes somebody's belief. And that's the big difference. Science has a method for establishing what we should believe is being true, but that mm. doesn't mean it doesn't change. Science changes the whole time. Yeah. But yeah. you know, if, you, if you've got an argument between somebody who is scientific and uh, putting a scientific argument, somebody who's got strong beliefs, the person with the beliefs isn't gonna shift regardless of evidence because it's belief. Yeah. The scientist yeah, no, no, is prepared yeah. to move on because they look at the evidence and say, okay, I, I accept that. You know, basically yeah. I've made a successful career out of being wrong and learning the whole time through it. It's, it's a great way of getting paid. Yeah, we were talking about this, me and Kathy Murphy this morning saying that all of these YouTube clips, there's gonna have to be some kind of um, disclaimer put on them of this was recorded in 2020 and this was the thought at the time because people are gonna be able to access this digital content five years time. And we don't know that we might have actually really changed direction with new material. Oh, there's gonna be a fascinating, you know, there's gonna be a fascinating change in how people do history because, mm. you know, people's lives are recorded online now. You know, the idea that, you know, yeah, people are getting, you know, you could look up anybody and find a, about them nowadays. It, it's interesting. One yeah. of my my youngest son, he was actually very cautious about me saying anything about him in social media. He said, I don't want to have digital presence. Now, he's he's changed in recent years, but I actually thought that I couldn't understand it initially because I was thinking, oh, this is great. You know, we could, yeah. Facebook's and whatever. But he was actually far more savvy than me about it. And he started yeah. to realize. I mean, just imagine if, I mean, uh, I know you're a lot younger than me, but you're still a little bit older than Very mature for me. Ages. Imagine if all of your childhood had been recorded on smartphones. You know, mm. I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want that content no, out there. There's lots in my life I'm glad people don't have witness of. Anyway, yeah. anyway yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to what we were talking about last week. Um, we started our conversation and pretty much hung around the topic of pain and behavior. There was a paper that came out, I think it was beginning this year, February 2020, and it was you and a really large group of your, your colleagues that came together and said, this is really hard to put down solid stuff, but let's start trying to kind of categorize how pain and behavior are connected together by using our experiences, the studies that we've had. And let's really look at how many of our cases are what we believe related to pain and it came out with the stunning figure or well for us it varied from clinic to clinic we had about 82 percent of our referred cases we thought had some sort of medical complication so oh. um we don't know exactly the reasons for that but each year when we look at our caseload it seems to go up and up and up um mm -hmm. you know yeah, and I think that's, that just shows what we said, you know, with science, we're continuously learning and beginning pieces of the puzzle together. So in the paper, it's, it's extremely well written. I'll put the link again. It is 
absolutely accessible by anybody. So please do not be daunted by the idea that there's an academic paper that you'd love to read and you're never going to understand it. You will. But what we're trying to do tonight is um, we went through the first two of four, which we'll quickly recap. We're going to tackle the next two. Then we're going to drift into something that I'm really passionate about, which is behavior that makes pain worse. And how can we explain that to people? Um, and then we were going to talk a little bit about first opinion vet work and how we can actually be more at picking up pain in the clinic environment so we can help people. So do you want to just cap recap first? Sometimes and somewhere along the line, we'll have to say, oh, and we now have to have part three to capture all that. <laughs> oh, and by the way, by the way, congratulations, because since we spoke last week, you got the impact award. You should say something about that. I know. So, um, and not well, actually, we've got really, the Impact Award from the Royal College, which is an, a very prestigious award for basically trying to make the world a better place as a vet. Um, yeah. And so I well love you and the whole team. <laughs> I know. But what I found funny is that when I very first met you, you said, Hannah, you've got to realise you're an impact champion. And I was like, I don't understand what that means. And I just saw this big fat person falling out of the first floor window being this impact champion. And now there you go. I'm at RCBS. Yeah. So thank you. Very kind of you to, to note. So um, let's start with the first one, which is the most logical, which is that the behavior is a direct manifestation of the pain. And can we just give people a few? Yeah. So, so we, we, we'd have said the sort of pain and behavior. There's at least four types of relationships that can be described. And so not to think that 82% of our cases are in pain and that's all that's wrong with them. So in the first group where pain is the direct cause, that's the most obvious one. Um, so the dog that is aggressive because he's got a sore limb and you go to squeeze it um, or, you know, you, you go to give him a cuddle and so he snaps or something like that. That's mm -hmm. the sort of, that's the classic one. Um, it's quite difficult to do research. And this is one of the other things. And I'm actually in the process of writing a paper about the moment about evidence-based medicine and some of the limitations of it. It's very difficult to do research in that area because you can't have a whole population that's standardized unless you're going to induce the pain into them, which I'm not prepared to do. Uh, so, um, but there are clearly those cases that, you know, you treat the pain, dog gets better. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. And so let's just I'll quickly list my from my amazing crib sheet. <laughs> So we've got the defensive behavior. So um, when the dog is lying down, reluctant to move, when the dog is approached, a Jekyll and Hyde type character. Um, and as you said, there's a really direct link there. Changes in learning capabilities. So these are dogs, performance dogs that aren't um, meeting expectations. They're not able to learn. They're Just not in able relation to that, because not all of the audience are vets. There's, um, I, 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 I've sort of give talks on pain and behavior and I, I went to one dog group and um, somebody came up to me afterwards and they said after listening to your talk I'm, I've got a dog that doesn't like to sit down in class I'm going to ask the owner to get his hips x-rayed and she mm -hmm. sent me a copy of the x-ray afterwards basically every time this dog was asked to sit it was asked to dislocate its hips they were so yeah. bad and yeah. again you know it, the dog wasn't complaining and I, I know this is one of the things that got picked up last week but if anybody's sort of either forgotten or didn't listen last week then you know one of the things I think is really important to appreciate is dogs work hard to fit in dogs do not create problems for the sake of creating problems they want the easy ticket which is to fit in with their human so if they're not fitting in with their human then there's a good reason for it it's maybe because they don't understand what's required of them or that what's being asked of them is too much or they make the judgment that it's it would be easier if the human changed rather than they did. Um, no, it is. I just say that dogs are amazing at coping because there is an alternative. They don't know that there is an alternative. They're just going to get on with what they've got and make the best of it because, as you say, they want to fit in. Yeah, and um, dogs live in very much in the here and now. doesn't mean they can't make predictions about the future, but they don't worry about the future. You know, you might be worried about, you know, you've got to pay the mortgage next month. How are you going to do that? Dogs don't travel in time. And interestingly, yeah. you know, in, in human evolution, it's a relatively recent human innovation that humans could actually plan to hunt different types of prey at different times. They could detect those patterns. Well, if that's only been around in humans for less than a couple of hundred thousand years, I can tell you it's not evolved in dogs, those sorts of abilities. 
So yeah. this is, um, I know you said we'll talk about this later, but we'll talk about it now because we've got there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, you know, dogs aren't thinking about the future. And again, this mm -hmm. is one of the things that sometimes surprises owners. When you tell them that their dog's in pain, they say, but he loves, he loves going for a long walk and playing with the other dogs. And that's because he's living in the here and now. And the pleasure of playing with the dog outweighs the cost of the discomfort. Now, some it's it's not uncommon that dogs will finish play with a yelp, even if they're not in pain. But sometimes they are in pain when they do it. Um, it is just one of the signals they use to say that's enough. Mm -hmm. um, and th there's a whole load of research that needs to be done yeah, there. Yeah. I can I use um, a couple of examples so people know what we're talking about here? Because this is like the real life, what I've experienced. Yeah. I had one case um, here was a Shih Tzu, had severe lumbosacral disease and hip OA. And we were really struggling to control its pain. But when I realized what was happening at home, it made sense why the medications wasn't working because the dog was still running down three flights of stairs in a townhouse to run and pretty much attack the front door every time they thought somebody was going past the front of the house. Yeah. So, and Anna was allowing it because she was like, well, it can't hurt the dog because they wouldn't do it otherwise. And I was like, well, that's why we're not going anywhere. Yeah. So in that situation, you know, the immediate interest just completely outweighs everything else. Now, the animal that doesn't mean that the animal, well, our brain will suppress pain at, when we're really focused on something else. But that doesn't mean that later on uh, the animal doesn't feel discomfort. So mm -hmm. one of the things we ask people about is, you know, yeah, he enjoys the walk. So what's he like in the evenings? And we plot it on a daily basis. And sure enough, mm -hmm. on the days when he's had a long walk, then what we find is that he's more grumpy in those evenings. Mm -hmm. And just you know, you you, you plot the, the associations. When owners see it like that, then that often brings it home to them in those in that context. Help people understand like this time delay because I think this this isn't taught to to vets and to the the GP and dog trainers. What is the time delay between that neurochemical state that that you know I'm loving this, this is great, have a great time, and then going. Hmm. I'm not feeling so confident. It, it varies enormously. It depends exactly what they've done, really. Um, you know, it and, and depends how much pain they've put themselves in. I think it's, I mean, some dogs, the pain will be too great. So it's, it's a, really that balance between how much pain they're in versus how interested they are in the other thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, if a dog has got into a certain habit of doing things, it will do it anyway without thinking. And then, yeah, it, it, later on, it it feels it, it feels the discomfort um, and i think i think this is something that's really a, almost one of the most important topics we're going to talk about because as a as a vet or maybe as a behaviorist or a dog trainer and so trying to get this across to the owner is very very difficult and um another example would be a dog that was actually so painful i couldn't touch it it was it, i would say it's probably allodynic because you go touch it please don't touch me <laughs> But the dog would still have a fixation on the pigeons on the garden lawn and it would fly through the house, slide across the laminate, trip over the step and smash into the glass at the back door. And it would do that again and again and again. And once we put a translucent um, cover up over the glass door and we put some rugs down and we started looking at trying to break that um, repetitive compulsive habit, actually the dog's pain state started improving. But that was really hard to try and get the owner to understand that a dog. So, yes, yeah, so there are problems. Animals can have problems with that inhibitory control. And yeah, mm -hmm. they will, in which case, they will do things even though they're painful. I can remember um, a case I had many years ago of a dog that had been rescued and it literally bit the pads off its feet mm -hmm. and it would make them bleed. Now, you, that, that is a painful thing. But if, if they, got and there's many reasons why animals do repetitive behavior um mm -hmm. but if they've got a complete loss of that inhibitory control they will do painful things mm -hmm. uh, and in some situations animals will self-mutilate in order to self-stimulate anyway right okay so this is where i become really non-pc but i'm okay with this <laughs> um in humans you have people that self-harm because mm -hmm. it them this feeling this um feeling of control uh, a, a slight euphoria uh, it just helps them deal with the situation often like um, 
concerns upstairs. Um, do animals ever do behaviours that we know would cause discomfort because it will cause some kind of neurochemical? <laughs> yes. So, so there's, there's two types of reinforcement that goes on. We get reinforcement from the external world, and this is, uh, but you also get reinforcement from within the body as well. So that's mm -hmm. after you've had a meal, you feel good. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think, I'm trying to think, did we chat about this last week or not? Or have I been chatting to somebody else? I don't about think it? so. Um, okay. Else. So there are these two types of reinforcement. And one of the things you've got to be careful of is that uh, people who use a lot of food in reinforcement, those external reinforcers can actually start to remove internal reinforcement okay. so the animal then only does the task for the external reinforcement doesn't do it for the enjoyment of it right and this is this is the slightly darker side and why we need to do a lot more research on animal training everyone talks and of course training with rewards is better than training with punishment but yeah. it is possible with rewards to actually produce an animal that is not getting much pleasure out of what it's doing Yes. Um, and that's that's a dark side that's really, that's really relevant to what we do because there's a lot of people that talk about using treats with um physiotherapy and hydrotherapy because there's a potential that the dog is going beyond pain that they're, they're pushing themselves too far too quickly because that treat is better than what they're going through and i know there a lot of school of thought about hydrotherapy being very careful not only for the ingestion of water but using a tennis ball or a treat that's going to make that dog so focused on that they're not actually going to work within their capability. And that's, you start adding a whole level of complexity, don't you, when you start saying, well, you can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it, 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 is, it is complicated. I think we've gone slightly off topic anyway. And anyone, but. Um, yeah, sorry, guys. Right, let's get yeah. back to it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. so we've got the direct manifestation of pain and yeah. those. I was reading to you were like house soiling problems, attention seeking behaviors such as clinginess, changes in learning capability, um, defensive behaviors. And I would like to think that um, all of us are beginning to become more aware of a direct link. So we've got PICO, repetitive behaviors, destructiveness, fear, anxiety, resource guarding, aggression to the owner, refusing to go for a walk, disturbing and waking the owner at night. Our second category we talked about in great length. Wait, just in relation to that, though, so before we go to the second one, because, again, mm -hmm. one of the things that people sometimes and vets in practice can get caught out by this is the relationship between fear and pain. Mm -hmm. So if you've got pain, you, you will also have a fear of pain. And it's very easy for the vet in practice to see a nervous dog thinking the dog doesn't like being at the vet without realising that, the dog doesn't like being at the vets because it is associating the vets with pain. And I don't just mean that it's going to get jabbed with a needle to be vaccinated, but because it's going to have its joints manipulated or, it, you know, it's going to be shoved onto a table and or asked to jump down off a table, which it never does at home, that sort of distance. And it's learned that association. Equally, when they manipulate the limb, they might complain and say, oh, well, you know, I don't think he's in pain. He's just very nervous. Well, mm. why is he nervous about having his joints manipulated? Mm. And, you know, there's no reason why a dog should be nervous about having its joints manipulated in the presence of its owner if it has a good relationship with the owner because they provide safety and security to it. Mm. So, yeah. you know, before we rush to say, oh, well, he's a nervous dog, think, why is he nervous and could that relate to pain and you know if the answer is yes it could be then let's err on the side of caution but yeah that's the first group anyway that's the first group and i think you could actually spend about three of these webinars just talking about that <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna go again tonight. <laughs> <laughs> i just still keep looking like, looking like an alien abduction because their power's gone Unidentified pain underpinning secondary concerns within the initial behavior problem. Um, so this was incompletely managed cases. We were very concerned because owners often get frustrated with this. The categories were um, in pain being an integral part of the presentation. Pain is a secondary concern or there is a relapse. Mm. Our studies was the destructive nature of the border collie that had an Achilles um, injury. Um, and we had also the cockapoo that was resource guarding and wouldn't walk. Do you remember that? 
Yeah, I mean, so the, the 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 problem in those cases is it looks like something else, and it is something else, but part of it is also pain, and that's why they get missed. Yeah. But actually, well, we're managing this. We're seeing an improvement. We just need to keep on with the treatment to get to the end. But you never yeah. get to the end because that one bit of that problem is related to the pain. And yeah. the issue then can be that if you don't treat that one bit, it then relapses completely because actually now mm -hmm. it's distressed, especially if it's a, in a sort of negative emotional state. Yeah. Uh, well, and then the pain then brings back all the others. So, yeah, this, you know. So, um, yeah, th there's, there's lots of examples of that. And if you're in one negative state because of pain, that's going to increase the likelihood of other negative states like fear and frustration as well. Yeah. So then we met, we finally had to give up after about an hour and 10 minutes and say, OK, we'll come back because we were just heading into exacerbation or one or of one or more signs of the problem behavior as a result of pain. Um, and this is where we start talking about the influence of mood um, changes associated with pain on problem behavior. And our example here was the Labrador that had been on medication because of anxiety, aggression, etc. And we were doing really well. You guys were doing really well with the behavioral modification. But when the owner stopped giving the pain medication, we got a recrudescence of yeah. pain problems. Yeah, and we've had a few cases where um, what we've done is that the, the animal comes in and it's assessed as being anxious, but we also identify that there is a focus of pain. And um, one of my residents, Kevin McPeak, he was involved in an um, initial trial for uh, Pexian, which is now licensed for anxiety. And as part of that, we had to get owners to keep a diary and to score um, the responses of the animal's anxiety. Mm -hmm. And we said we we would take animals that were in pain as long as it was under control. So we prescribed painkillers for this. And what we saw was that, yeah, one or two of the signs completely disappeared. But other signs dropped down markedly and some were hardly touched at all. Right. And, you know, and this is this is why you can't just say, oh, well, it's due to pain, you know, but without taking away that pain, you know, it'd be a lot harder to manage that case. Yeah. And you may never. Um, resolved in that situation so you've got that exacerbation and you know if if you're a good trainer you want to train an animal that can be trained so let's take away the pain first before we start training the animal yeah and I think that is a human nature thing that we always want to be able to distill down to one problem because I think human brain wants to make everything you know fit we like to categorize the world that's it's and it's very much a, actually a Western philosophical tradition as well to categorize things. In the Eastern tradi philosophical tradition sees things in much more shades of gray. They still like to categorize things, but they recognize that it's not one or the other. You are a bit of both. So it's yin and yeah. yang. Yeah? yeah. Whereas we, the Western tradition is, is to force into one or other category. Yeah, um, we see. I think we see that a lot in first opinion practice because you can see someone's face just going, "No, not that, and that. Oh, and that, and really, he's got that too." You know, well, actually, it makes sense. You know, things can occur at the same time, or things can make other things more likely, can't they? So, I know when you see an owner, they just want all of that dog's clinical signs to fit into one little category, and it doesn't fit like that, which really goes nicely into we were going to talk a bit about the cognitive um, dysfunction and I think this is a nice place to spend a little bit of time because we do have a big cohort of owners with elderly dogs um, because OA is obviously detected more commonly later in life even though it's a disease of the younger dog um, and there's a lot of people that get very confused of what is a behavioral manifestation of pain and what's a behavioral manifestation of you know, cognitive dysfunction to dementia. How can we help them? Yeah, it's it's a difficult one because we're only sort of in the early stages of being able to look at some of age-related changes. But there is a nice article, and I think you can find it on the internet. It's uh, DVM 360. Um, I was wondering if it's Julie Albright off the top of my head. Um, it's referenced in the pain paper. Um, and it talks about, yeah, the similarity of signs between, she wrote the original article and then um, 
somebody else came in and wrote a reply and said, well, you've got to be careful about confusing cognitive dysfunction with chronic pain because they have very similar signs. You know, if you're in chronic pain, you're going to be easily distracted. Mm. Um, you know, if you are in chronic pain, you're not going to sleep well at night. Mm. If you're in chronic pain, your social interactions with others is going to be poor. If you're in chronic pain, you may start house boiling because you don't want to go outside to walk. These are all classic signs of cognitive dysfunction in dogs. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's very it's it's very difficult to distinguish between them. Um, and they may have I'll, both. Yeah, absolutely. And I suspect most of them have. Um, yeah, I'll, no. I'll how many of them have, you know, yeah, how many of them have got primarily chronic pain? And yeah. it's, and it's it, really you know, sad that think of all these dogs that are on, say, Vivitonian or Activat or BD diet, and they're actually going, just give me some Medicare. <laughs> yeah. Um, which um, will lead us later into our pain examination, which we're going to come back to later, because I think that's a really relevant point, is that even if an owner comes into the vet and their first instinct that it is CCD, dementia, that doesn't exclude having a really good examination to make Absolutely. sure. And don't categorize the dementia as worse than the pain because we know that it isn't just a them and us. They can certainly be working together for that dog's outward appearance. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. It's just not, don't jump into one category or the other. When you get old, you start getting everything wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Every bit starts to go. Yeah, but I think this is a good point for us to stick up for the vets in this situation. I know when I've been working as a first opinion vet, at present, there is a real difficulty to diagnose multiple problems with multiple interventions, not only by the lack of time, but because the owner really is in fear of the vet bill. So the vet is inhibited with going, well, actually, I found this, this and this. I'm really sorry. Um, and this and this and this is the interventions that we should now explore. So please, owners listening to this, we don't go out with the intention to find problems. You know, we are trying to identify what is presented to us. And unfortunately, sometimes, many times, we will find multiple complaints which all need equally addressing. It isn't us trying to make money out of you. We're not trying to make you go out with as many products. That really isn't. And very quick aside, I don't know any vet that is on any kind of kickback. So we're not there going, oh, actually, I just sold an extra bottle of shampoo and I've got five pounds in my back pocket because of it. It doesn't work like that. That is not how the vet industry works. Um, I would like to say that every vet that I have associated with in the last 18, 19 years have not had any kind of commission-based practice and they're doing the best that they can. So Would sorry it? you go to the vets and you get multiple problems. Yeah, and, and and that's absolutely the case. But if if you know having worked with the PDSA, I know you know some people are very limited in funds. Um and people will make enormous sacrifices for their pets. If you are in that situation, ask yourself which of these are impacting on my dog's quality of life most. And prioritize mm -hmm. it on that basis. You know, if you have yeah. to prioritize, just ask the vet and have that conversation with them. Um, and, you know, the, the vet will sort of try to do it. And it's not about which one is sort of most interesting, um, but which one is actually causing suffering at the moment. Mm. Um, and I think that if you can have that conversation with a vet and they'll, they'll take you through, that's, you know, that's what a professional service is. That's why you can't just be Dr. Google vet. You know, that, yeah. and, you know, as vets, you have professional judgments um, and that comes from experience as, as well as your training. And that's what owners should not be afraid of having those conversations. Um, no. And I've got a little bit of black humour here from my mother. So I blame my mum for this one. When I had Holly and I felt the world was on my shoulders because she had multiple complaints and I wanted to do the best for her. She actually sat me down and said, Hannah. I'm on the NHS, they're getting round to me, doing it bit by bit. Just give yourself a break. And I was like, actually, that's really true. You know, my mum's been waiting for an op for about six months and she's managing and she's coping. And so do breathe deeply. Many of these conditions can be managed over time and you can have a step-by-step -step approach. Don't be ashamed 
and to ask your vet to allow you to do that. You know, it's, it's all about communication, communication. Yeah. Um, let's just quickly talk about the fourth category because we can go wild on this. Adjunctive mm -hmm. behavioral signs associated with pain. So that basically means these are signs of pain that are not the obvious ones like, um, you know, dog biting, etc. These are just, um, you know, the dog is lame. It's got an abnormal gait. Um, mm. Fair enough. That's uh, the dog is standing and it's shifting around a, a lot. You know, dogs are meant to often will stand still. Why can't they stand mm. still? Again, one of the interesting things is that, you know, we talked about people like to categorize. Our brains are also set up to try and confirm what we believe. That's, mm. again, you know, if you believe something, you look for the evidence that supports it. That's what being a scientist tries to train you out of that. Mm. You know, if you, somebody tells you that so-and-so is a nasty person the first before you've met them, you'll extract all the information that supports that belief if you like that person who's told you that. And that's just what brains will do. We bias the world. You know, the, we don't live in the real. Nobody lives in the real world. I don't know anyone knows what the real world is, except maybe one of the physicists. Um, but we respond to the world as we see it. Um, so if you believe that your dog is anxious because he he's never seems to be settled, you interpret that shiftiness in his weight as, well, that's signs of his anxiety. He can't settle. He's anxious, as opposed mm. to. He's got four sore legs and he's not sure which one he should be putting the weight on, you know, yeah. or he's got two sore hips and he's not sure what to do about it. Um, and th again, we've got to be careful. about. And likewise, it can go the other way. If you believe your dog's in pain, you'll look for the signs that he's in pain when actually it may not be significant. He may be anxious about something else. So we've got to be careful about that bias. So, you know, there are. There are some sort of obvious ones, as I said, like the, the changes in gait and whatever. But then there are the uh, there's another group of signs, which some of which we, I think we started to talk about this last time have become normalized. So mm. dogs sitting in funny ways that sort of sit like a baby or like a frog sit. I sometimes call them, you know, with their backs tucked underneath them or with their legs sticking out. Um, and that happens in puppies because their hips aren't well developed. But it shouldn't happen um, as a normal feature of most adult dogs, I'd suggest. doesn't mean they're in pain, but it means their hips probably aren't the right shape, which mm. could ultimately lead to it. Um, dogs who go to lie down, they circle and they stop. And, and then they move somewhere else and they circle a couple of times and they stop. And then they drop like a stone. That's mm. not how dogs are meant to lie down. They're supposed to circle. It's thought that the reason why they circle is they're flattening the grass. I, I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, before they lie down, uh, that's where it comes from. It's, it fairly it goes back to the ethologists and these pre-programmed behaviours that we were talking about before. Yeah. But um, but you know, so unusual patterns, and then you've got this whole other range of things like lip licking. Um, yeah, let me get the list. Licking yawning now the one of the things to be aware of with behavior is no behavior pretty much is has one particular cause mm -hmm. we have a limited number of behaviors that we can perform and so lots of different motivations can feed into that if we take a non-pain example you know a dog can go humping because it's sexually aroused or it can do it because it's frustrated Mm. It's still humping, and people think, "Oh, you know, my dog's hypersex." No, he's probably just frustrated. It's it's the same behavior because there's only a limited behavioral repertoire of things you can actually do. Absolutely, so, yeah. A dog that is yawning could be tired, but it could be a sign of chronic pain. People yeah. talk about it in relation to anxiety. We're not actually sure that, that, that you know whether it's anxiety, whether it's frustration, or anything like that. And to me, that you know, they are different states. They require different treatments. Yeah, and um, I'm just putting a hand up there. I've had many dogs where we've started to deal with the pain and the dog's gone back to start yawning again because they're comfortable to do so. Um, so if you've got a dog that's had all their weight thrown forward and they've got a huge amount of muscular compensation into their shoulder complex, necks up into their TMJ, into their jawline, and they're like, ah, don't like yawning. Ah. Yeah. And he's like, ah, I quite like yawning again. So, yeah, yeah right, it doesn't have to, nothing's pathonomic. It never has yeah. to be. Equals yeah. that. I mean, that's um, a very word pathodomic, which. Um, did you like that? 
it's just in there. It don't, yeah, and it probably most people don't know what it means. It doesn't mean that just it's showing that sign, it means that's the that's the cause, yeah? It's that link yeah. between the two. Um, so I've got a list here. So I've got abnormal gait, propping oneself up against convenient objects. My dog did that. Interruptions to gait, sudden freezing, an unusual approach to lying or sitting, unconventional sitting or lying posture, unusual or hesitant defecation and urination behaviour. A squat is quite difficult. Nibbling or scratching specific areas, skin flippers or yelps, restlessness, um, excessive sniffing, anxiety or owner comfort seeking behavior. Yeah, head shaking um, you can put in there as well. You know, this sort of they do this um, wet dog shakes. They suddenly, you know, again, walking along and then suddenly doing this wet dog shake with sort of shake down and whatever, um, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing spontaneously dogs yelping for no apparent reason well there is yeah. a reason no dogs don't do it just i'm going to see what, what my owner makes of it if i suddenly yelp at them um yeah. they're not seeming like that so all of those can be um yeah triggers of that though they're the sorts of as i say what we call those adjunctive behaviors they're incidental behaviors i say some of those i think are more obvious but there's lots of the ones that we're starting to tease out um you know you might think of these little reflexes and things like that um and um yeah so we need to yeah, be aware no, no, of so i think i think at this point having gone through the, the four categories and being very honest and open saying guys this is a really exciting field and this is changing quite quickly and we're seeing um, a real change in percentages because last time we talked about how in previous years people have had a look at their caseload and gone well I think five percent are related to pain and then a few years later someone can says well I think 20 percent of my cases are related to pain and now we're hitting the dizzy heights it's almost like the covid crisis isn't it we're going up up and up with the connection but what we need to really establish is that it's an exciting field, it's changing, we're learning a lot, please stay current. Be careful of your own biases and be careful of your own education. I think if only you had listened to me and Daniel before we went live, I was talking about what I got taught 18, 19 years ago and it's very different to how I perceive and act as a vet now. So you need to stay current and aware of your own biases from your own education and experience. And the thing that we were, one of the things we were talking about, which I think is quite important, my late father, he was a vet and he was old school, um, but he taught me, you know, a few really important things as a vet. And again, maybe because also I started off in the PDSA where, you know, things were slightly more limited. He's, you know, he said, remember, your best two diagnostic tools are your eyes and your ears and, and make sure you educate your hands. Mm -hmm. um, you educate your hands both for diagnosis you feel and you feel for unevenness you feel for tension in muscles and if you do surgery you have to respect the tissues mm -hmm. uh, and my father was a very very good surgeon um he's a fantastic uh, woodworker actually when he retired you know he um because he had that precision um and yeah so um you know and they're perhaps skills that are you know people tend to think about oh what's the blood test that needs to be done blood tests are there to uh, blood tests are there to provide further evidence you should not in my opinion as a vet be doing a blood test thinking oh, well i don't know what's wrong with the animal we'll see what the bloods tell us you should have yeah. a clear hypothesis idea that you're going to test with the from the bloods as well you know yeah, you need to have a direction. That, that sometimes gets lost out now there is a there's a difficulty, and I'm, I'm glad that you know we don't live in this country in such a litigious environment where people still do allow the vets to have the you know their judgment as we're going to prioritise this. Mm. Where in some situations, you know, people are so worried about being sued that they say, well, we have to do the test to rule out everything because if it is that nasty thing which occurs in one in a thousand cases, mm. you're going to sue me. Well, that yeah. means that 999 people are going to have unnecessary blood work done on their dog. Um, yeah. Well, you would say maybe 10 of them should have it because it was really quite difficult to tell. But 990 of them didn't need it, actually, if you're willing to trust that. And just, you know, uh, my father told the story, actually, um, when he was at vet school, you know, that the clinic, well, there's, there's two stories I remember him telling me about. Um, one was, 
a lecturer comes in and says, I have a problem with today's lecture. Half of what I'm going to tell you is not true. Bear in mind, this was the 1930s and 40s. Said, but that's not the problem. The problem is I don't know which half. <laughs> And that's that's pretty true, even of modern day, you know, science yeah. is going to change. So yeah. some of the things that we think are true now are not going to. The other one was the lecturer came in with a sort of steaming pot of horse pee, dips his finger in, licks it and says, right, I want you all to do the same. So this jar gets passed around and this wouldn't happen nowadays. And all the students had to dip their finger in and lick it. And he said, well, I hope you've learned um, two important things here. First of all, horse pee is not toxic. And secondly, you must use your eyes. I dipped that finger and licked that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking it's going to be some evil trick. No, uh, no, you know, I think you're know. very right. I think that also leads us very easily into, there are lots of people that are concerned that any presentation that their dog has must be pain. And I know that at one at a certain point in my career I've gone oh my god everything's got pain and everything must have pain because it's so common and that you can fall into the trap of spending a lot of time worrying about it and then these people go to the vet and say well just image everything just do everything that you yeah. need but dogogram. Do a dogogram. <laughs> yeah don't do a dogogram so let's now talk about how we think that people should know what to ask for what to expect to try and bring it all together so in my mind what I'd love people to do, having listened to this, is gone, oh, it could be pain. So now I'm going to collect as much evidence as possible. I'm going to structure it in a way that my vet can easily interpret what I'm trying to suggest to them. And that's that suspicion of chronic pain PDF, which Lynn is going to put up for us, which would be great. Um, so you go to your vet and you say, I've got a suspicion because of this, isn't this? I might take some videos. I might take some photos of the way my dog sits, where they sit. So I might video them trying to get comfortable, trying to do the stairs, trying to get in and out of the car. I might report some incidences of um, some deleterious behaviours towards other dogs or people. What happens when they get to the vets? What would you like to happen? How would you like things to progress then? Sorry, from the point of view of the owner or... I'm so let's, let's, we're daydreaming. This is like gold standard. If anything was possible, what would you like to happen? The owners turned up with their iPhone with loads of videos. They've got their PDF of all the different. I, 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 I don't think they should turn up with it. I think they should send it in advance. Okay, good. I think that's the first thing because, you know, with the cases that we get, they all, they, they get triaged the cases. We have a technician and a technician will review all the videos, etc. cetera. I, I, I gotta be this, might sound like a terrible admission. This is the reality. I do not spend four hours looking at a client's videos. The technician no. looks at it. Says, "Daniel, can you go and look at that bit? This doesn't look right." Or, "This look. This is what I've captured. Have a look at these bits." I'm not going to spend four hours looking at a video. Uh, no. In the case of horses, you can do it at high speed, and you can pick up on some of these behaviour changes because you see that they're changing posture much more readily. Um, so yeah. sometimes, if you've got that sort of uh, facility, um, then uh you can do that so i would you know ask whether or not there is a a you know, somebody who gets paid less than the vet who will review this for you and you know and you're willing to pay for that as an owner and say look i've got all of these concerns rather than spend a lot of the vet's time doing this would you mind having a look at this if there's an you know if if, if there's a nominated vet nurse in the um clinic who's got an interest in that area and see, you know, and that might also help. And again, we, we often hear, you know, behaviorists who are not vets have difficulty sometimes persuading vets. Again, forming a relationship with a vet nurse who can have the vet here and review the stuff and say, yes, I agree with you. I'll bring it to his, her attention in order to bring it, it may well help. Mm -hmm. If you go, you know, if you go with too much information, you want the consultation to be focused, yeah? Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Um, and so that point, I just can I just quickly say, no. <laughs> you do have a little bit of responsibility to make sure the video you're sending in is relevant. So no ceiling shots, no video clips of 20 minutes where the dog isn't even in the picture. Break it down, put it onto your laptop, you know, cut the relevant section. Yeah. You want your vet to stay engaged. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's, what's really useful is if you've got two bits to show the contrast. So this is what he's like, you know, on uh, an evening 
uh, this, this is how he walks on an evening when he's not had a long walk during the day. This is how he walks in the evening after he's had a long walk earlier in the day. Go on. It's five seconds of each. Can You can see the difference. Yeah. yeah? That's the yeah. way to do it. And, um, you know, we, we were talking earlier about, yeah, the dogs are not um, thinking in advance. And that's that's one of the things that catches people out, you know. But my dog still loves his walks. If he was in pain, he wouldn't love the walks. Well, no, because he loves the walks. He goes for the walks. And yes. Some dogs will do it because they think their owner wants to go for the walk, I suspect. Yeah. They'll do it yeah. out of loyalty to the owner. But they will still go and play with other dogs. Um, yeah. But the owner complains, yeah, in the evening. But, yeah, he does have that. That is when it's grumpy. And plotting that and presenting those plots to the vet can be really powerful. So, look, I've seen this pattern. What would you make yeah. of it? Um, yeah. yeah, vets don't like being told this is the case by owners. That you know that's annoying um, because th there are other possibilities, and the owner might yeah. be right. But yeah. it's better to say, you know, this is what I am concerned about, and here is the evidence. What do you yeah. think? And I think also giving the vet time. In that, I've got um, Charlotte's just said. I find there's a lot of reluctance from vets to work with behaviourists like me and knowledge of what we've seen. And I, I, I hate to say, it, I agree. There is definitely still um, not the multidisciplinary team forming. There's still massive improvements that need to be made. Um, we also talked about how I know. It's an interesting thought. It is a really radical thought. Different. How about the fact that behaviourists ought to be working in practices like vets, uh, like vet nurses? Mm -hmm. Why yeah. not? You know, why shouldn't it become a profession like vet nurses where they are embedded in? Um, because then it will always be under veterinary supervision. It will educate the vets to be more aware of those things. Yeah. I don't know. I think also there is definitely, and this is a total tangent, I think there needs to um, be some respect of each other's um, workload. And it wouldn't hurt for a behaviourist to actually see the pressures that a vet is under during a day so they can understand why they don't come across as completely engaged and focused and able to spend an hour. I know, uh, being a first opinion vet, I would put my heart and soul into the day, but there are some times that I just couldn't do what people asked of me. But... Um, that's the side. So you, the, the owners arrived, the vets had the, the video footage, they've had the suspicion of chronic pain document, they've had a brief. Um, what would we like owners to expect their vet will do when they arrive at said practice? What's the process? Sorry, I'm, hang on. I, what would I so, like? so, the owner, so the owners got there and they're, um, they've just come out of their car and they're coming into the waiting room. What sort of advice can we give them as they're about to go into their consult and what should we hope the vet will do whilst they're having that examination because we're trying to find pain. So have, have they been to a behaviour person or they've just got the concerns, are you saying? They've got the concerns. Um, well, as I said, I think to, to have everything prepared um, mm -hmm. and to have things written down mm -hmm. so that they do make sure they cover everything, the full breadth of the available evidence, because as I said, uh, there's, not, there's not, no one thing that is going to tell the vet the answer. Mm -hmm. um, I always, when I was in practice, you know, I, I was a great believer. If an owner was concerned about their animal, they, they knew their animal. My job was then to try and work out why they were concerned mm -hmm. um, and not to, never to dismiss. Um, but, you know, to work out, and I might, I might come to the conclusion that actually I think that's, that's not, you do not have to worry about it. I acknowledge that it's there, but don't worry about it. But you shouldn't say, mm -hmm. well, there's nothing there. Yeah. 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 So you have to find something if, if the animal has got a change in the behavior. Um, you want a vet who is going to do a proper examination. If the vet can't do a proper examination, you have to ask the reason why. And it's, you know, and if the vet says, well, I don't think it's safe to do so, well, that's that's perfectly justifiable reason. But why is it not safe to do so? Oh, mm. well, he's got bad behavior. Well, why has he got bad behavior? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because, no, I totally agree. And I um, think, um, like, so I have to I have to thank Sarah Heath for me for this one, because I'm not a behaviourist. I'm a first opinion vet. So one of the reasons that um, I'm quite happy to put myself out there is I want people to be on my learning journey. So anybody that's watching, I've learned a lot in the last five years I've been running CAM. I wasn't I wasn't educated with a complete picture. I'm picking things up as I go along. 
And um, I spent a little bit of time with Sarah Heath, who's the lovely Sarah Heath from Behavioral Referrals. And um, she put me on the spot and she did a fake consult in front of a group of students, said, Hannah, just be the vet. And I went down and greeted the dog and she went, whoa, no, no, no. And I was like, oh. But I, I kind of thought and I'd been taught on the client aspect of things that owners love you to greet their animal. It's a way to build a good rapport with the owner. The owner would rather you said hello to their dog before them. It's really important they're here because they care about the dog. They want you to too. And that's how I'd been taught with some consultation technique um, CPD I'd been on. Greet the dog first. And I was like, oh, wow, right. So I need to completely ignore the dog, greet the owner, and just let the dog bed in. Yeah, um, so, so you were thought by somebody who was interested in business and building good customer relations, yes. not somebody who was um, a vet who understood actually what an animal's needs are in the surgery. And, yeah, you have to give the animal time to settle in and to feel comfortable. Yeah. And there, there are times when you might want to greet the dog. It depends. If the dog is coming to you, then, yes, you greet the dog, I would say. Mm -hmm. But the dog might just be coming to investigate and sniff, and you've got to look at the way that the dog approaches. So, you know, you've got to read the situation. There is no one size fits all. I would say sometimes greet the owner first, sometimes greet the dog first. Yeah. Sometimes you will get down to the dog's level, sometimes you won't. Um, yeah. it, will, it will all depend on the particular case, but you have to read the animal in real time. Yeah. So um, I think home owners don't um, be surprised if the vet is not making eye contact with you and they're just kind of watching the dog and they seem a little bit distracted with the hello they're taking in information about how that dog gets up from their laying position in the waiting room how they move across the floor what their body posture mm -hmm. is like, how, what their initial kind of assessment of the new environment is like that's a sign of someone that's really actually looking at yeah. your case and that's a good thing and the thing is you know Vets are actually taught this. They're they are taught to be observant. They're in taught to interpret signs in order to make diagnoses. Um, it just seems to be that as soon as you put the word behavior in front, it's as if it's, well, I don't know that discipline. And I think, you know, vets need to get over that hang up. They are taught to put things together. And we sometimes take for granted what a skill that is, actually. Yeah. We've, yeah. we've had it drilled into us over five, six years of education till it becomes second nature. And the idea of formulating differentials, it could be this, it could be that. We take that for granted. That's not a natural skill that a lot of people can do. I say most no. people have an opinion and they'll gather the evidence to support it. Yeah. And that's, yeah. the, that's the thing we have to guard against. And, you know, a, a good vet will... And, that's why you don't tell the vet this is what is wrong with my animal because their job is to assess the differentials, the other possibilities. Yeah, um, and so and and what I'd like to think is that even with a busy day, even with a high stress load, the vet is able to be observing what your dog's doing and how it's moving and allow the vet to do so. So don't try and immediately grab their attention and it's all about me, listen to me, talk to me, I want your eye contact. The vet is absorbing. Yeah. And then the dog to actually settle in the room because you might find that that dog takes a lovely little sitting position with its legs stuck out to the side or it might actually slow yeah. down and you know sit on its left hip rather than going into a nice sphinx um lay yeah then we were talking earlier because i confess that from university i do not remember being taught a pain assessment i don't remember being taught this kind of global overview I remember very much being taught in a system by system basis, but also a joint by joint basis. And I feel that in the first part of my career, I would have gone straight into the problematic limb. So if they said, well, I think, I think, you know, in fairness, you know, it's, it's part of the general idea. We were taught that certain conditions were painful, but that there is a shift and especially because, you know, veterinary practice has moved from being large animal based in my father's day to, largely a lot of small animal based so there is much more emphasis on quality of life mm. and you, you said you graduated nearly 20 years ago well you know this is something that has happened in the last 20 years so and whilst owners have for a long time had that as a concern it's not something that perhaps has been intrinsic to the veterinary curriculum because it, it's been focused very much on health 
Mm. Um, I think that's one of the things we need to be aware of is that yeah, you know, depending on when your vet graduated, this idea of quality of life and therefore assessment of pain and discomfort may not be something yeah, they've received formal training in. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I think um, palliative care and senior care is becoming much more um, commonplace. So we had a lovely Facebook Live on Tuesday with a vet that is very fo focused on palliative care. Mm. And I from what she was saying and how I felt people are like why would you why would you focus down on there you know a bit of a random area to focus on bigger picture being a vet doing amazing surgery doing emergencies yeah mm. I was like no that's where I'm interested so please go and listen to her she's she's really fab um the next thing to talk about and I know that you've talked to Julia Robertson about things like you know the subtle signs of pain on touch mm. and interaction and I know that I'm, thanks to her, I'm looking for the dog's behavior. I'm looking for the way that they tense. I'm looking for whether they look at me. I'm looking for an inhibited, just let's get this over and done with. I'm looking for the subtleties. Um, and that takes time. It takes mm. time and it takes the dog a chance to relax and say, okay, go on then, let's have a, you know, let's work at this together. So, Pain is really difficult. And I think I'm saying this because I don't want to ever diss vets. I want people to realize how hard it is and how time consuming it is and how sometimes the practice is the worst environment that we could ever try and achieve an optimum endpoint, isn't it? It's busy, slippery floors, slippery table, high stress. And that dog's got to go, I trust you to touch me where it might hurt. And by, the, and by the same measure, we also have to appreciate you can teach a dog not to show pain. So there's many really good trainers and if they don't recognize that the dog is in pain, you know, they will change the animal's behavior. But that might mean that the animal continues um, either, possibly as a ticking time bomb. It says mm. I'll put up with this until one day when it doesn't. And then it bites for no apparent reason. Well, it was because it was trained not to show the pain, mm. possibly through the use of rewards. You know, I'm not talking about people being punitive in this situation. If you don't recognize pain, you know, then you can, you know, dog, because dogs want to please, they will mm. do what they can. And if you mm. keep saying to it in a nice way, I want you to sit, I want you to lie down nicely, etc., and you keep doing it, then the dog will do it regardless mm. of the pain. You know, I can mm. teach a dog in pain to lie down nicely. Um, I can shape the behavior. And so we've got to be careful of seeing people saying, oh, well, you know, I train dogs and I don't see this and whatever. Well, yeah, and you might be a very good trainer, but if you don't look for it, you won't see it. No, no. And I think that's um, that's where I get a chance to big up Sarah Fisher. Like, I, I, I really think, you know, wow, she's had to, to bat a lot with her free work where trying to allow a dog to be in a very low stress environment, not working for you, not trying to please you, being able to be independent of you and being able to move around and exhibit posture, movement patterns, a behavioral yeah. response without being pressurized to do what they think. They so want. I think, you know, and we've got to be careful the way we talk about things. We talk about obedience. Well, obedience means you do it. You are obedient. Most of the time, there are, there are a few commands, I think, that, animals should learn and they're non-negotiable. So if I say mm. stop, stop. If I say mm. perhaps lie down, you lie down because that could save your life. And mm. I want that to be trained. And I don't want you to do it because you're thinking of a reward or anything like that. I want it to become like drill training. You do it without thinking. That's, mm. You develop a, what we call a stimulus response habit for those sorts of commands. But most of what we ask are requests. And if they're mm. requests, then, you know, if I ask of something of you as a request, I listen to the answer. And mm. that's what they're doing the whole time, you know, and that's what trainers should be doing the whole time and owners. They're making requests of their pets. And if they think about it as a request, that also means they need to listen and look at what the answer is that they get, not to mm. say, I told you that's to do it. Just because they've said it, that the animal must do it. I don't, I, yeah. I don't think that's the case at all. If, you know, um, if you're walking the dog, you could ask that you could wait at the junction and see which way the dog wants to go. You can decide today. That's fine. You know, but today I'm going to decide. If the dog shows some resistance, does it really matter whether we go left or right today? No, that's okay. That's yeah. fine. Yeah, and I, I think uh, just because I have a little little demon inside me that always kind of brings me back to what a cynical person or a non-believer or somebody that's quite set in their ways 
why are we talking about this, Daniel? Why is this important? Now, from my aspect, because what triggered me to set up CAM was that many dogs were enduring pain for a long time, shouting about it, like in a, in a shout, oh, and we weren't acknowledging it. They were becoming debilitated more quickly. They were then losing their independence, mobile independence, and being put to sleep. And that we are now have proof of with the work from Vet Compass. Musculoskeletal disease, which OA is a big feature, is a leading, if not the leading, cause of elective euthanasia. And that means that that dog hasn't just suffered overnight, they've suffered for, if not months and years of pain. So why are we talking about the subtleties of behavior? This is our first opportunity to say there's something wrong and we can do something about it. From an owner perspective, if you catch it early, you've got more choice, there are more interventions. Many of these interventions are free of charge. They're not gonna be drug related. They're gonna be behavioral modification because of lifestyle change, weight loss, changing the context in which that dog lives, asking different things of that dog. Um, so the earlier you catch it, the better the results, the better options yeah. for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. The, yeah, you say the earlier you get it, the more options you have, um, and the more chance you have of maintaining very good quality of life. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the, uh, I can't remember if I said this last week or not, but, uh, you know, John Webster was one of my lecturers down at Bristol, and, and he told us very early on, remember, killing an animal is not a welfare decision. How you kill the animal is, it's mm -hmm. an ethical decision, though. Um, if you're interested in welfare, you're interested in how the animal is while it's alive. Mm. You yeah. might be interested in how you're going to end its life, mm. but the decision to end its life is an ethical decision. And we have to keep those separate. And, you know, we don't want individuals to suffer. Um, mm. you know, it's, it's, it might sound very simplistic, but I'd like to think that when I shuffle off this earth, it's a little bit better for me having been here. That's, that's sort of, yeah. that's, that's what gives my life some meaning, I think, you know? Yeah, no, exactly the same. Uh, exactly the same. And I think sometimes you have to take the muddle, the spaghetti in the middle out for people, because sometimes I've talked to friends and colleagues and dog owners, and they've really not understood this, this fascination, the attention for detail. And when I go back and say, well, actually, the attention to the detail now is because I'm saving the later. And if you don't listen now, the late is going to happen and yeah. the late is going to end in tears. And when you say it like that, you kind of people go, oh, yes, catch you. And the other, the other thing is, going back to what we were saying earlier about vets and, you know, the expenses of it. If you get it early, you may not need medication or anything like that. You can, you know, you can ask the vet about what can be done as far as managing the environment at home in order to reduce the issues and reduce your costs. You know, yeah, and the hobbies and the habits they have. Yeah, so Sorry? I've had I've had a couple of dogs where they've stopped throwing the ball, stopped using these blinking ball chuckers. They've accepted the dog shouldn't be having these kind of outrageous um, manic moments in the house, flying around the lino, up and down the sofas, in and out the back of the car. By actually controlling that, getting the weight off the dog, the dog hasn't actually needed pharmaceutical intervention drugs. Um, so please be savvy. Think about how these little changes are really, really important to acknowledge. Um, so we've gone for 68 minutes. There are going to be questions. What I'll do is I'll go through them later. And if there's anything that I can't answer, I, I will come back to it. Um, Jackie Braggs, I do love this. And um, feel free to be able to <laughs> one of my, my students. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> She's one of my research students. Guess what? She's working on cats. So I can see her question. <laughs> there. Yes, Jackie, it does apply to cats. They do get even less recognition. Um, you're quite oh, right. right. Um, so close, that. so close. Um, well, like guys, as we said before, if you found this useful, I know that um, Professor Danny Mills, like me, just wants to actually help as many people and get this word out as widely as possible. I know he loves educating. So if you found this useful and there's areas that you think I really want some clarity or some conversation, because quite often there might not be clarity, but there certainly is conversation put it in below and the more people that say thank you the more reason i have to ask him to come back <laughs> yeah well no, it's, been, it's been a pleasure and uh yeah i'm happy to uh chat like this and uh, i think i said to you before I've, I've started doing podcasts with people that were inspirational to me and so i've got this little youtube site of these are some of the pioneers in the field 
and you know if, if you're interested in behavior there's interviews with people that some of you you may not have actually heard of um but they're really important and it's important to understand where our ideas come from um so mm -hmm. have, if you're interested google what makes you click with a question mark there's there is a youtube site which is completely different with the same name um you'll see interviews of me chatting with other people uh you'll also see these videos up here because that's where i put the last one as well so i'll put that up okay. there as well but i don't think i have anything like the following that you do um, and, um well i have to say that the cam team and the cam ambassadors absolutely legendary people they really really are so within your thank thank yous i'd like you to say thank you to cam ambassadors that manage yeah. our they do it voluntarily and their cam team and veterinary professionals that give up their time for free so it is an awesome team behind the scenes yeah no, oh, links to your podcast. <laughs> cool well i'm gonna say thank you i'm gonna see um daniel again <gasps> yep see you soon <laughs> and take care good night everybody um thank you so much for joining us we'll see you next and time congratulations on the award once again and you really are an action woman i saw the pictures of you on the behind a speedboat at the weekend. <laughs> I know. I'm thinking, crikey, she really is full on. <laughs> See you later, guys. Take care. Bye now.